All right, welcome everyone to uh, today's event, this really exciting performance and discussion that we're gonna be putting on with Independent Jewish Voices Canada. So just as people are coming in, I'm gonna welcome everyone and introduce myself. My name is Aaron Lakoff. Uh, I'm with Independent Jewish Voices Canada. I'm the communications and media lead. Uh, today's event is, is one that is very unique. We haven't really done an event like this with uh, IJV. So we're very, very uh, blessed and honored to have with us a special guest all the way from London, Jackie Walker, who is a phenomenal activist. She's been an anti-racist campaigner for a long time and a playwright. And uh, she's gonna be performing excerpts from her play, The Lynching. And then she'll be in conversation with Dara Title, who is one of our members with IJV and also a playwright. And uh, I'm gonna introduce them both in just a little bit. So thank you so much for, for being with us today. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Independent Jewish Voices, uh, welcome to one of our events. Uh, we're an organization that was founded in 2008, and so we bring together Jews from all across Canada. We have chapters in every major Canadian city and smaller Canadian cities and campuses across the country, uh, and we're an organization that's very much founded in the Jewish tradition of social justice, of mending the world, and of course working on just and peaceful solutions in Israel-Palestine. And so we were the first Canadian Jewish organization to endorse the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement, or BDS, in solidarity with the Palestinian people. We've been working on that ever since. One of our main campaigns that, that we're doing, and we're gonna get deep into talking about this today, uh, is, is we're working on defending space to, to be in solidarity uh, with Palestinians uh, here in Canada and throughout the world. And one of the ways that that space is under threat is through uh, an insidious definition of anti-Semitism uh, known as the IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Association's um, definition of anti-Semitism, which we'll get into talking about that more in just a little bit. But for those of you who want to find out more about that campaign, we have a website, which is noihra.ca. We'll put up a few of these links, of course, uh, in the chat in just a little bit. Um, but I would invite people, if you want to find out more about the work of IJV, you can go on our website, which is ijvcanada.org. If you want to sign up to our newsletter to hear about future events like this, it's ijvcanada.org slash newsletter. And of course, if you enjoy events like this, we're always putting on events for free, uh, but they do cost money. There is always a cost. And if you wanna support more events like this, you can make a donation to IJV. It not only supports future webinars, but it also supports our work. And you can do that at ijvcanada.org slash donate. So with that being said, I'm going to introduce Dara Title, who is our moderator for today. And Dara is gonna take it away and then introduce uh, Jackie. And, and I'm really, really thrilled that, that Dara could do this event with us. Um, Dara and I actually met in, in the chaos and confusion of the G20 protests in Toronto 10 years ago. That was, for people who don't know, that was the largest mass arrest in Canadian history when the, when the G20 met in Toronto. And, uh, and we met there and we've been friends and comrades ever since. And, and I've always been a fan of Dara's work. It's really an honor uh, to be able to work with her in IJV. And so, um, so it's really fabulous, Dara, that you, could, uh, that you could moderate this event today. And just to introduce you, Dara Title is a socialist and playwright living in Toronto, Ontario. Well, she's actually joining us today from Berkeley, California, where she's doing an exciting residency. Her most recent credits include the Omnibus Bill, Behavior, Corpus, the Apology, Marla's Party, and the CBC radio drama Palliative, She Said Destroy, and many others. Dara was the GCTC's playwright in residence in 2015 and 2017, during which her two most recent plays were written. Her journalism, fiction, and poetry have appeared in various periodicals and journals throughout the country. Dara is the winner of several awards, including the 2011 Canadian Jewish Playwright Award, 
and the 2007 Canadian Peace Play Prize. Her plays have received nominations for Dora Betty Mitchell Rideau and the META Prizes for Outstanding New Plays. Dara also works for the Action Canada for Sexual Health and Rights and is a founding member of the Courage Coalition and a proud member of Independent Jewish Voices. And so with that, Dara, I'll turn it over to you. Sarah, that was quite an introduction. It's very touching for you to remember where we met. Um, so welcome all and big welcome to Jackie Walker. I've admired Jackie from afar for a very long time. And uh, can I just say what a privilege it has been to get to know you a little in preparation for this event. You're a true comrade. And welcome to Independent Jewish Voices, which is Canada, <laughs> this Canadian hosted virtual space. Um, thank you seriously for bringing your wisdom and your play to us who live here on this stolen indigenous land. So Jackie's play, The Lynching, was meant originally to be performed three times. Instead, she's performed it hundreds of times across the UK, the EU, and the United States. It's never come to Canada, but maybe it will soon. Um, and it's a true testament to how powerful the play is and how hungry audiences are to see work of this kind. So how we're going to do this event, just for those who want to know, um, Jackie will read small parts of her play and in several of her different character voices. And then between segments, she and I will have a little bit of time to talk about the content of the play. And then at the end, there will be time for questions from all of you. So please type them and save them and send them off to Aaron um, in the chat and the Q&A function. Without further ado, I give you the lynching. My name is Dorothy Rebecca Ferguson Walker. I was born in Spanish Town, Jamaica in 1917. Yes, I know what you're thinking of now, but there is not an inch of Botox in this face, just very naturally great genes. I did well at school. I did exceptionally well, in fact. I won a scholarship to become a doctor at the world famous University for Colored People, Howard in Washington, DC. I had a great time at Howard. I had never been with so many well-educated colored people like me before in, in one place. And we look good too, you know, I mean, some of them, why? <laughs> Okay, 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 yes, I am sticking to this, what I'm doing. First of all, when I realized about politics in America, I was walking down the hall and I hear it, first of all, like a whisper. When Israel was in Egypt's land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand. Let my people go. So I go to the door and I push it open and suddenly all the voices, they are all around me. When Israel was in Egypt's land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard I could not stand. Let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land. Tell old Pharaoh. Let my people go. So God pronounced and Moses said, let my people go. If not, I'll smite your firstborn dead. Let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land, 
tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. You see, this was just after the war, the Second World War, of course, and politics then, well, you see, it was a dangerous game. They were telling us that the enemy was the Soviet Union and communism. And there was this witch hunt led by this, you may have heard of him, Senator Joe McCarthy. You know him? People who stepped out of line, people who wanted to change things, they were accused of being commies, of being un-American. They were smeared. They lost their reputations, their jobs. Some of them people, you know, they even lost their lives. So I became what you call it now, Yes, a political activist. But now if you think about it, if it was a hard time to be in politics, you imagine what it was like to be a black activist. You see, at that time, there was legalized segregation in America. Well, at least in the South. And it was what I would call an apartheid state. And the people in power, they're no different from the people in power now. Those people, they never want change. You resist, you are a threat. So the government responded same way it responds now, with terror, state terror, and also with lynchings, a kind of legalized murder. Hi, my name is Jack, Jack Cohen. <laughs> my family came from Russia in uh, 1918. We were escaping, you know, to the land of the free. We landed in Ellis Island, ended up in Brooklyn. I mean, of course we were Jewish, you know, Jack Cohen, but we weren't religious. I mean, my dad, he was a communist, but that didn't stop him building up the jewelry business. The Alhambra Jewelers. Stack them high, sell it cheap. But it got me the best schools, you know, Ivy League, that kind of thing. Funny, he may have been a commie, but it's what my dad wanted for me, to be an all-American sort of a guy. <laughs> but whatever else there was, there was always the politics and what my ma called that music. Even had my own club, you know, went to Harlem, checking out the talent. <laughs> and that's when I saw her. It was music that brought us together, but it was in the politics where we fell in love. How did I get into that stuff? You know, fighting for colored people's rights? Well, just think about it. Remember, and there was a, there was a thrill, you know, because that's where real change was going on. But more than that, as communists, I believed that being at the bottom of society, having been brutalized, murdered, kept as property for centuries, colored people, well, they were going to be the first people to demand change. And like all the rest of my Jewish comrades, now just remember, uh, this was only 10 years since the defeat of the Nazis. Well, we knew what it was like to be treated worse than animals, to be treated like subhumans. So me and Dorothy, we went down south to what she called the belly of the beast. And we boarded their segregated buses. 
and we refused to be apart. I kept hold of her hand as long as I could till we were dragged off and beaten. Truth is, we were lucky not to have been lynched. You know, I learned so much from that woman, but by now, the CIA, they had me and Dorothy in their radar. They couldn't deport me. I had a passport and my own business, but Dorothy, they went after her. And in the end, they got her. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Jackie. So um, to start off, uh, I want to ask you for a moment of context of how you sat down to write this play. Because some of you will know and some of you won't know Jackie's personal history um, and the, the lynching, the witch hunt that she experienced within the, the British Labour Party. Um, so if Jackie, you could just provide for us uh, one minute of context of where you were when you sat down to write this play. And then the second part of my question is, when you sat down to write this play about something you've experienced yourself in a very contemporary political drama of today, you find that you not only have to begin in your own personal history, but in the personal histories of your parents. And I want you to help us understand why it was those stories, the stories you just performed for us of your mother and your father um, that brought you to this point in time where you have to write about this play and this experience that you had. Okay, so what happened to me was that I, uh, having become um, really quite high profile within the Jeremy Corbyn movement in the Labour Party, I was accused of anti-Semitism and suspended from the Labour Party. And what I found very much to my shock and dismay at the time was that there was no platform giving the alternative argument to what had actually happened or what I'd said. Because what we found was that the media were totally unwilling to report what actually happened. So I kind of sat there and thought, what, how would I get this story across? And that's why I and a comrade of mine, um, uh, Norman, actually sat there and we wrote it uh, to get our, uh, our stories across. And in terms of um, why I, I sort of embedded it within the story of my parents, I think there's a lot of reasons. I think firstly, all our stories start well before we're born. You know, our stories are also the stories of our parents and our ancestors. And it struck me that being the daughter of a Russian communist who had met my mother, who was black and of Jewish descent as well, and was a civil rights activist. And having been the product of that and, and the product of McCarthyism, that this was history repeating itself. And that we need to actually be informed by history to recognize these patterns so that we become familiar with it and recognize the struggle for what it is. Right, awesome. I find it fascinating always as a playwright, what you sit down to start to write something, you think you've got it all figured out. And then of course, the very act of writing it leads you in all these wild directions. So yeah, it's yeah. Remarkable. Okay, I wanna bring us back to the play. Let's, uh, let's go to excerpt number two. Jamaica. When you think of it, what you think in your fear, you think a paradise. When white people got there for the first time, they say they discover it. They call it tabula rasa. You know what that means? Well, it means empty page. Perhaps they were blind because in fact, there were thousands and thousands of Indian people living right there. 
but they soon sort that out. They hunted them with dogs, ripped them apart. They trod them from the mountain and the ones that are left, they work them to death in camps, not giving them enough food and enough rest. But Jamaica, you know, it did not develop like other places. It was what I would call artificially constructed. The first totally industrialized society built for one purpose alone, the production of sugar and slaves. And all that wealth was being sent back to one place. This place, this Great Britain. Now, long after that, after the Second World War, Britain was in trouble again. And you come back to us for help. You needed people to work on the buses. You needed people to work in your hospitals. So the British government, they sent out this man. You might have heard of him, Mr. Enoch Powell. They sent him over and all Enoch, he say, well, please, please come and help us. Come and help us in the mother country because we are suffering so bad. <laughs> I went to escape poverty to get a better life. But you know, when I get there, England was not some kind of place of hope and glory. There were no golden daffodils on the streets. I was walking up and down. Seemed there was just a whole load of very poor, very sick looking white people and some terrible housing. But I still have to find somewhere to live. And I'm knocking on the doors. Even when I see the signs, they say, no dogs, no Irish, no coloreds, doesn't matter. So I tell the children, stay behind the wall. Wait, be quiet till mommy come and get you while I ask for a room. Don't worry, it's just a game. They don't believe me. My name is Jackie and I am eight years old and this is my diary. We came to Britain in 1959. I had my fifth birthday on the boat. I ate all my birthday cake while everyone else was being sick. <laughs> After we moved into our new house, our doors and windows got smashed. My mummy got them fixed, but they broke them again and again and again then they painted a a a swast a swast ticker on the door that was so everyone would know where the darkies lived by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down, and yes, we wept when we remembered Zion. After my mother died in 1965, I, I was 11, I was put into what they call care but it wasn't care. I mean, that's just a euphemism for children that they don't have anyone to care for. They call it in care. I left care when I was 18, pretty much the same way as I came into Britain with a suitcase and 25 pounds. 
after that, I kind of went from one job to another, whatever I could find, factories, cleaning. But I ended up going to university and teaching. I joined the Labour Party sometime around 1991. Well, because I thought it was a socialist party and I desperately wanted change. Blair came, I went, but not because of the Iraq war. I left because the so-called reforms that he was making to the Labour Party. Blair went, I came back, but long before Jeremy Corbyn became leader. Now, I suppose I have always been what they like to call on the hard left. I have to do that because every time I've been on the TV or in the newspapers, they have a picture of me looking hard and left. Hmm. But I've always been a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn and, and John McDonnell, though there seemed very little hard about it at the time. I mean, most most meetings that I was organizing, we'd be lucky if 10 people and a dog turned up. I remember one meeting when the dog didn't turn up. But then, did you hear it? Did you get to hear it? Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. Talk about a change. The last couple of years, it was amazing. It was weird. Then I was elected the vice chair of Momentum. Ta-da! Sounds grand, doesn't it? But the truth is, all they wanted was a convenient black face. What they thought was a safe pair of black hands. You know, somebody who would do what they were told. But I took the job seriously because I was looking for a new, more straight talking, ethical politics. Wow, so it's, it's that image for me that really stands out in this of a, a black child experiencing an anti-black act of racism and what uh, she is getting is a swastika. And the, of course the, the hidden, the less visible part of your identity is that you are Jewish. And then to have that sort of brought forward in time and to be accused of uh, anti-Semitism as a black Jew and I mean, you're probably talking to a whole room right now of Jews who have been accused of being anti-Semites ourselves, which is, anyhow. Um, and so I want to sort of discuss the intersections of your identity. And I want to hear from you, tell us, tell us why and how the intersections of your specific identity both enable and complicate your activism. Well, it's a gift and a curse at the same time, because it makes everything I do really difficult. There is no way that I can foreground one set of suffering against another. But I'm, I, have, I have within my in ancestry, both slave masters and slave owners and slaves. And I also have the peoples who have experienced the most extraordinary genocides, holocausts and oppressions that have gone on for hundreds of years. So I, I kind of feel impelled, I have to speak out. And what people want from me is they, they want a simple story. You know, what they want is simplicity and I refuse to give them that because the world is not a simple place. And we fool people to encourage them to think in these simple little boxes where all Jews 
look like this and all black people look like this. Um, and I think it's really an important thing for us to all be thinking of. Absolutely. Um, I want to continue on this line just for a moment and talk about politics and playwriting and the art of playwriting and why you choose theater of all the, you know, seemingly irrelevant and archaic forms of art. And I mean, I have my own opinions on that. I, I also work in politics and I know from campaigning, as you know, um, that in order to succeed and win a political fight, you have to have you know, thousands and thousands of people chanting the same message, the same story, a very uncomplicated, simple message, right? We're always not allowed to complicate things in politics. Um, art allows us to bring in the nuance, to bring in the gray zones and to bring us into a world where things are infinitely complicated. And I want to ask you why and how you came to the decision to create a piece of art in the context of such politics. So I'd been doing what activists do. So I'd been traveling around the, the country and I'd been speaking to people and I'm not undermining the effectiveness of that, but I believe it can only take us so far because I think to actually shift opinions, to move people. And I learned this from being an anti-racist trainer. You had to engage people on an emotional, personal level. Somehow they have to be made or enabled, not made, to empathize. They have to have that. And of course, theater originates from a religious ceremony. There is a power within theater to move us. And, and I'd had some background in the theater as a, as a young person. And it seemed to me absolutely obvious that if I wanted to be speaking about very complex issues, not just of politics, but of the subtleties of identity and the subtleties of oppression, that theater and song and a personal story told by me that I am the person that these things have happened to would be the per perfect vehicle. It's moving. <laughs> it's a defense of the theater. And we're now, of course, in this context where live arts can't happen, don't happen. Um, it's also, I think, important for us to acknowledge for a moment the time and the place that we're in right now. We're talking about communism and struggles and inequality and racism. And we are, uh, you know, in this moment of time where nothing has brought that out to the foreground as quickly and as monstrously as the COVID pandemic. And I was wondering if you might have a moment just to sort of talk about what it's like right now um, with COVID, with Brexit coming. What is it like right now in the UK on the ground? It's awful. I mean, you know, in terms of, I'm speaking now as a black person, um, and as you, I'm sure you know that black people are dying and becoming ill uh, from this much more uh, than other parts of the population. And at the same time, this whole rise of nationalism with Brexit and being squeezed as well by this focus on only one form of racism means that as a black person, the interests uh, of, of, of people of color are being squeezed out and squeezed out at the same time that we see a rise, not just in the far right, but in the rhetoric of the right, which is now being used by our politicians and politicians in the Labour Party, as well as in the Tory party, and certainly being used in the media in a shocking, shocking degree. So at this point in time, I think I, like a lot of black people, are feeling quite terrified for the future. I think uh, a lot of people on this call will We'll um, empathize with that. Uh, let's go back to the play and then we can sort of continue on the discussion of contemporary politics after. Um, so please, Jackie. Now, like Jackie, Mr. Corbyn, he has been accused of being a Jew hater too. Now, I want you to think is Mr. Carbin a Jew hater? 
You see, because I do not think so. But when he was just a member of parliament, Mr. Corbyn, what he was, was a big supporter of those Palestinian people. And he didn't mind telling folks what he thought about the government of Israel either. Just a few years back, he was saying that what Israel is doing, you know, putting Jewish people on Palestine land, he was saying it was totally unacceptable, an abomination, illegal. He even called some of them nasty people in Israel government. He called them criminal politicians. But nobody paid him too much name then, you know. There he is sitting in parliament with him, vegetarian jumper on, eating him peanut butter sandwiches. But then this something happened, a political miracle. Mr. Corbyn, they elected him the leader of the Labour Party. But you know, Mr. Corbyn, he has some big enemies, like, what you call it? Oh yeah, the establishment and people on the side of Israel. And well, if you ask my opinion, and I don't care if you don't ask my opinion, because you are going to get my opinion, there are too many of those tomfool jackass right wing members of parliament in our Labour Party. Yes. Uh, and when they hear about Mr. Corbyn being leader, well, it was like a political explosion. It was dynamite. Straight away, all these enemies are after him and anyone who support him. People like Jackie, and they call them all Jew hater. They even say, Mr. Corbyn and Jackie are second greatest threats to Jews in the world. Yes, Simon Wiesenthal Center in America. They say not Nazis, not fascists in Europe, not Hamas, not Iran and the nuclear bomb, no. It is my Jackie who is that. But listen, I want to tell you something quiet now where she's not listening. Jackie, you know, she have one big problem. And I think you know what it is. I hear what they say about her and it is true. She talk too much. She always has. Wouldn't have been none of this fuss if she could only have kept her mouth shut. Now, back in the old days, those people say exactly the same thing. Keep quiet. Behave yourself. And you might get yourself a good place in the master's house. But you see, one thing I never taught Jackie, how to be a good house nigger. All racism is despicable. All people deserve to be treated with the same respect. I do not seek the destruction of Israel. I seek to save Israel from its continuing slide into racism, militarism, and far right nationalism. But we must be free to criticize any political ideology that advances the rights of one people over another. And that includes Zionism. Palestinians, have the same right to a homeland as the Israelis claim for themselves. And we must be free to fight for that right without being accused of anti-Semitism. Now throughout history, whether it's 
the working class, whether it's women, whether it's black, whoever it be, we've been told, just keep quiet. Don't rock the boat. We'll get to you, promise we will, when the time's right. But as human beings, as black and as oppressed peoples, we must speak truth to power and resist however and whenever we can. Because the time to fight for emancipation is now. It's always now. My mother and father's people were black and white, Jew and Gentile. Like them, I refuse to move to the back of the bus. I refuse to play the minstrel. I refuse to remain dumb and blinded because the media, the politicians or anyone else says I should do. I refuse. So let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be accepted within thy sight. Oh, for I, by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down, and yes, we wept when we remembered Zion. so much Jackie. Thank you. Moving ending of the play and that for the audience is how the play ends. Um, I think we need to talk about the IHRA. Okay. <laughs> I think that this is something that um, let's let's break it down in my um, uneducated terms for just a moment for those who don't know. So the IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Association, I believe that's the right acronym, um, is uh, put forth a definition of anti-Semitism that they use all of their political skills and clout to have adopted by not only governments, but also by um, like through legislatures, but um, in turn to be used as the rule of law in different countries, provinces, states. And uh, what happens with this is it's a, it's a collusion. It's a, a coordinated attack um, where the extreme right and um, the Israel supporting Zionist uh, forces have uh, colluded together in order to do something which will effectively and is able to destroy the left and Palestinian solidarity at the same time. And so it serves both of their agendas um, while targeting uh, Palestinians for telling their own stories, um, anybody who supports and tries to defend Palestinian rights, um, and uh, the left at large. And by the left, uh, I mean Jeremy Corbyn's left movement through momentum in the UK and anyone else uh, who uh, begins to gain socialist political ground in various countries across the world, including in Canada, um, and who dares to speak out on behalf of Palestinian human rights. Um, I've, I'm sure I'm missing nuance and I'm not the best person to speak on it, but that's where we're at um, in Canada. And that's where the States, uh, sorry, the UK is further along in their journey through the IHRA. Um, and I wanted just to put that out there for some context. And then I want to ask Jackie, who is being expelled from the Labour Party right now and how? Okay, so this might come as a shock to people, but according to the figures that we know, if you're Jewish on the left and an anti-Zionist in the Labour Party, you are 10 times more likely to be expelled than other members. 
So there is a disproportionate number of Jews and people of color being expelled from the Labour Party. And the astonishing thing about that, because you've got to think that the media have been, I mean, even now, it's still, the, our papers are still full of it, but they never report the fact, the, the, the level to which uh, left-wing Jews are being expelled from the Labour Party. And uh, they're not asking the question, how come this is happening? Are suddenly all these Jews anti-Semites or what is happening? It, it's, it's quite shocking. All right, well, <laughs> let's talk about the witch hunt, both here and um, in the UK. And in some ways, I know that here, people who are watching these politics emerge. And uh, of course, Ontario has just adopted the IHRA definition and IJV was leading the charge against that. Um, through their lobbying and through writing numerous articles against it. Um, and it's been adopted uh, through Canada. In fact, just recently, I think in the last couple of weeks, Justin Trudeau has announced that um, Erwin Kotler, who is a former Liberal Justice Minister, retired now from Parliament, is going to be sort of the IHRA czar of Canada and be in charge of sort of bringing this definition forward into Canadian politics which could have really dire consequences um, on anybody. And uh, almost most insidiously, the IHRA definition makes things less safe for Jews because the right wing is colluding with it. The people who are subtly in defense of it are also those people who are subtly in defense of racism at large and of the neo-Nazis who actually do pose a credible threat to Jewish people in this country. So, you know, as you so eloquently put in your play, all racism is evil and wrong and bad. Um, so I wanna open it up to this room, to everyone who's on this webinar. And I'm sure there's lots of people here who wanna talk about the current context and to learn a little bit from Jackie who has sort of experienced the canary in the coal mine syndrome in regards to this particular virulent form of anti-left, anti-Palestinian racist attack. Maybe I'll invite um, Aaron back. All right, wonderful. So um, we're gonna take some questions from the audience right now. Thank you so much, Dara, for kind of uh, getting us rolling, getting us warmed up with uh, that conversation. And, you know, Jackie, thank you so much for the performance. It was really incredible, you know, sitting in, in my house, listening to it, as I'm sure people sitting in their living rooms from all around the world where people are joining us have, enjoyed it as well too. So we do have time for your questions and, and the way you can do that is just by typing them into the Q&A box uh, you'll see at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, the, the first one I wanted to ask Jackie comes on behalf of Tam and she asks, how did audiences react to the lynching as theater? As a theater maker myself, it's hugely inspiring that you chose to make a play. We need our own crucible like that uh, last McCarthyite witch hunt inspired by Arthur Miller to write. More power to you, Jackie. So yes, yeah, so how did audiences react to the lynching? It was, it was actually amazing. It was almost like there was a sigh of relief um, because what happens during any witch hunt is that people are disabled from exploring and expressing themselves. And you know, as we all know, theater is also catharsis. And what it did was release people to go, yeah, you know, actually I thought this was strange and wow, yeah, this has got historical precedence. And people were engaged and excited and um, they, I actually don't remember that there was any interruption uh, in the performances we had we had protests where people tried to stop um, sites, you know, um, us having venues. Um, but what was really interesting, say for example, when you took it around, was the different responses depending where you were. So when I took it to Northern Ireland, there was a very specific response there because of their experience of colonialism. And when I took it, to Prague, there was another experience there. So 
I mean, it was always informed by the local context. Thank you. Um, we have another question, I believe, from your collaborator and, and co-author on this play, Norman. And um, so Norman says, uh, ironically, this week, I've been the victim of the same witch hunt that attacked Jackie. Uh, what does Jackie think about the latest developments in the Labour Party's weaponization of anti-Semitism? And where do you think it's going? Right. I mean, in a way, it makes me feel like even though this, this play was written and being performed, you know, more than three years ago, actually, if we weren't on, on lockdown, we should be performing it again, because it was, it was prophetic in terms of where this was going. Because when I was suspended, there were very few people suspended and the awareness was very low. People, they were shocked. And now we see clearly where this is going. You know, Norman is being suspended from the Labour Party. In fact, again, something which is not being reported, something like 50, yesterday, something like 54 secretaries of local uh, Labour Party groups were suspended from the Labour Party. I mean, this is unprecedented. This is an unprecedented civil war witch hunt going on in the Labour Party, which is not being reported. And that is the, it's so important to get hold of that. And, and that links with what Dara was saying, because we depend on our media to act as our democratic bulwark against authoritarianism and fascism. And the echoes here of 1930s Germany are fundamental. We have a breakdown in that social contract, which says the media will act as that bulwark. It is, it is frightening what's happening at the moment. Thank you, yeah. And I mean, I, I agree 100%. I think a lot of us here in Canada are watching what's happening in the UK and, and you know taking the warning signs and and that's why we're, we're trying to come out ahead of it yeah. with independent Jewish voices to make sure that we're not seeing the same witch hunts and the same clampdowns on Palestine solidarity organizing uh, that, that we have over there. Um, so with that th there's a few questions that are kind of more specific to, to Jeremy Corbyn because I think it's you know, it, it's an issue that people um, want to know more about, obviously. And I think especially for people who are involved in, uh, you know, similar left parties here in Canada, whether it's the NDP or the Green Party, um, you know, learning from what happened in the later pa Labour Party can be really indicative. So um, there's two similar questions, one from Tom and one from Christine. I'll kind of group them together. So Tom asks, what responsibility should Jeremy Corbyn take for the witch hunt? And then kind of linked with that, Christine asks, how do you feel about the Labour Party without Corbyn as leader? <laughs> That's nice. Give me the easy questions first. That's what I like. <laughs> um, look, um, of course, Jeremy has responsibility. He was the leader of the party. But we also have to understand the unprecedented nature of what happened the fact that he had a parliamentary party which was in revolt against his leadership before he did anything. So you had a membership which was mostly all Corbyn supporters, but you had a parliamentary party. And remember we have a parliamentary democracy where what I call the parliamentary elite decided that they were the ones who could choose how to behave. And um, does he have responsibility for it? Yes, but um, I think you would have had to have been a revolutionary soul to have done it much different. And actually one of the reasons why Jeremy Corbyn was so popular was because he was a kind of Gandhi-esque figure, somebody who, who actually wanted to bring people together. So perhaps if he had been more of the revolutionary, he would have, wouldn't have managed to galvanize the movement in 
quite such a way. And how do I feel about the Labour Party now? Um, there's going to be people, including my partner, who might actually be listening into this and will be horrified when I say this, but I cannot vote for a Labour Party led by a leader who uses these kind of tactics against party members and who also has been so complicit with such awful racism, anti-black racism, uh, even recently, um, if I can just say to you what happened, I'll do it very quickly. He had a caller from a woman who, and we knew where she was coming from straight away as soon as she said this. And her question to him was basically, um, if in Israel they can have a Jewish state, why can't we have a white state in England? And of course, <laughs> that's a very uncomfortable question for him to answer. But rather than actually uh, criticizing what she had said in terms of the racism, he backed away from it. And he's done the same time and time again and shown that he has a, what I have called, and I got expelled for calling, a hierarchy for racism in the Labour Party and Blacks and Muslims and Romani people are very much at the bottom. And I will not vote for a party where that is so. I think there's, if I could just jump in quickly, I think it's impossible to listen to what you're saying, Jackie, uh, in Canada and not start thinking about the context that we're in right now and thinking about strategies and ways not to fall into the same sort of trap that's been laid out uh, for, for our political parties and for the left in general. And I, I wish I had something um, uh, positive to say <laughs> on that front. I worked in parliament for many years and I know kind of the backroom sausage and how it gets made. And um, I don't see all I'm seeing right now from our politicians, with the exception of like two or three principled people who are in constant threat of being expelled from their own parties um, for taking principled stands around Palestine, is that sort of centrist, terrified um, inability to make any sort of principled moves um, for fear that they go the way of the Corbyn. Yeah. Which is a bit absurd, right? Because nobody yet on the political spectrum in Canada is as, as um, as far left or as inspiring or as potentially threatening to the right and to the hegemony as Corbyn was in, uh, in the UK. Um, so yeah, I guess I have a, a quick question back at you and then we can go back to the audience, which is um, how do we bring some hope into where we are right now in Canada? Where can we find a kernel of something to believe in and some marching orders from somebody like you? Well, you know, I'm, I'm th these are your marching orders. You know, struggle takes a long time. Ask the native people, ask people of color, how long it took us to actually even get basic emancipation. We haven't yet even achieved equality. So your marching orders are progress takes a long time. And the other bit of hope is, Politics is this amazing, extraordinary thing. Things happen when you don't expect them. We never expected a Jeremy Corbyn. We don't know when the next Jeremy Corbyn moment is going to come or where it's going to come. And we have to be ready to take it and to nurture it. And you know, we have to be committed to that. You can't call yourself anti-racist unless you're going to engage with the struggle and the struggle is hard. Thank you. And there's a little bit of hope in there. I, I, I just wanna say that I was helpful in trying to found a movement called Courage, which was trying in some ways to model itself off of momentum and off of the DSA. And I'll just give a two second plug right now if people are interested in looking at the couragecoalition.ca for that sort of action, which persists in trying to find hope within the sphere of politics on the left. 
Wonderful, thanks. And Dara, maybe you could actually put a link um, to Courage uh, in the chat uh, if people want to check that out. Uh, I think we might have time for, for a couple more questions, Jackie, if you're right, staying with us for um, a little bit more. So uh, this is interesting questions coming in. Some of them are grouped around thematically the theater. Some of them are grouped more thematically around politics. But I think this one from Liz is interesting because I think um, you know, it very much speaks to the work we're doing with independent Jewish voices and, you know, looking at uh, like-minded Jews on the other side of the pond. And so um, Liz asks, uh, well, she thanks uh, both you and Dara for the very moving uh, event. And uh, Liz asks, uh, she's curious if there's other progressive um, Jewish groups or, you know, progressive Judaism in England. Are there synagogue communities or Jewish communal spaces uh, where these kinds of ideas can be voiced. Okay, so um, there are, there definitely are. Uh, at the moment, what we're being told is that progressive, what you'd call progressive Jewish voices aren't properly Jewish. You're not, we're not proper Jews because if you're proper Jews, you have to be aligned with Israel. Otherwise you're not actually Jewish. So that's one thing. And in terms of the synagogues, one thing, that you have to understand is, I think, I believe, uh, I don't know so much about the Canadian uh, Jewish community. I know more about the American community because I, I've actually got dual passports. So my, I have family in America as, as well. And I was, of course, born in the States. Is that the Jewish community um, in the UK now, it wasn't always so, is much more conservative and more aligned to Israel than the American one. And one of the reasons that that's happened is because one of the things, one of the awful things, many awful things that Tony Blair did was establish religious schools. So what that has meant is that the younger generation of Jews in this country, many of them go to religious schools where, as far as I'm concerned, they're indoctrinated from the day they enter with a certain narrative. And it's very hard for them to break away from, from that. But there are those separate voices there, but they don't get media attention. And, you know, I don't know how similar that is to you, but, you know, so that is one of the reasons, again, why we did the play. Thank you. Um... This one from Diane, I think is interesting because uh, a lot of the times in our circles, it, it's interesting, like speaking with other Jews, uh, there's this phenomenon that we've described, progressive except Palestine. Um, and, and so we know that for a long time within Judaism, there's been incredible traditions of, of you know, social justice movements of you know, Jews you know, standing in solidarity with uh, black folks in the US during the civil rights movement. And, and yet, and yet the conversation around Palestine continues to be one that is so hard to broach with friends and with, with relatives and with, with people in our communities. And, and so Diana asks, uh, when I try to talk uh, with, with mainstream Jews, they're eager to oppose racism, but hostile to seeing the racism of Israel against Palestinians, what would your advice be in, in terms of approaching those conversations? I, I, I think it's really hard. I just think we have to be quietly, and I mean quietly and calmly kind of persistent on that. I don't think it works to be antagonistic in that context in particular. But you know, my, my partner is, is Jewish as well. And we have our own stories where there's been fundamental uh, relationship breakdowns on this. It's a hard path sometimes to tread, but I think we have to remind people of what, what the motto of Jewish Voice for Labour is, which is always with the oppressed, not with the oppressors. And, you know, that was something that of course originated in the Warsaw Ghetto and it epitomizes what is at the heart of Judaism. 
Thank you. And I mean, we have so many questions coming in. Unfortunately, as usual, we won't have time to get to all of them. But um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one more from, from the audience. And this is from Christine. It's kind of a nice question to close with is, uh, what are you doing for your next play? <laughs> yeah, the problem is, I doubt if my next play would be produced by anyone. Uh, what, what, what I am trying to do is to now write a play that is about the Black experience going right from slavery onto the present day. If you like to be in touch with that Black Lives moment. One of the problems for people like me though, is you know where it's gonna be put on and who's going to actually produce it. Because one thing that they've managed to do is to smear my name. And, you know, this is a real thing that happens. This is McCarthyism. And just like Hollywood writers never worked again, uh, the same thing I'm sure would happen to me, but I am going to be writing another play. Wonderful. I'm gonna uh, just throw it back to uh, Dara Title, our moderator, just before we uh, close out today. Well, just remember that when Arthur Miller wrote, wrote The Crucible, he was also blacklisted <laughs> by McCarthy. And I'm so, so glad that your mother never taught you to not speak too much, <laughs> Jackie, because everything that you've said to me uh, in this um, session and in the weeks leading up to it has been really informative and um, uh, more than informative, it's been inspiring. And I think that your choice to work through theater is, um, as you said once in an earlier conversation that we were having, uh, a testament to the power of empathy. Um, and if we can continue to try and wrench empathy out of even our political enemies, I think there is hope for the future. So I wanna yeah. really thank you for sharing with us today mm -hmm. and for your talent and for your wisdom and for your life of activism for the causes that we all care about. Thank and you. That, I will say goodbye to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, again. And thank you to everyone for joining us again. You can check out our website, ijvcanada.org, to find out about more events like this. We're going to have more events coming up in the new year. So the best way to stay in touch is just to uh, sign up to our newsletter at ijvcanada.org slash newsletter. Again, thank you, Dara. Thank you, Jackie. And um, have a safe and wonderful holidays to everyone. Happy New Year. And uh, we'll see you in 2021. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.